recording yet, which I'm going to do now. Okay. Okay. So the staircase model gives us seven different layers of what a result of a social project can be. First level is activities are carried out as planned. Second is target groups are reached. Third is target groups accept offers. That's typically what's called output. That has nothing to do with social impact yet, right? That's just seeing whether the machine works that you've designed. And then the levels above, they are a bit more interesting, right? For example, level number four is the target groups change their attitude and or develop new skills. That's when you have you know, social effects. Fifth one is target group changes their behavior. So it's more than just attitude, it's actual behavior. Six is the target group's living conditions change. And the seventh, in a, in a, in a bit more of a strict definition, that is what people actually call impact, society changes. Now I'll make an example. Um, can you unhide the example, please? Mm. So one example here is level one would be something like I offer mentoring for migrant ch school children, like some kind of mentoring offer. That would mean you, you carry out your activities. The second level would be something like migrant children know about the offer. So you find a way so that they actually know that it's happening. That means you actually reach someone with what you're doing. The third level would be, um, so target groups accept the offer, the migrant children actually show up for your mentoring class or for your mentoring offer or whatever. So they actually participate. We're still at the level of output, right? There's still nothing about social impact here. This is just, you target someone and these people show up and you do something for them. Now level number four, change of attitudes or developing new skills, that would be something like migrant children think math is not that bad after all and they become better at it. So you see an actual change in the intellectual capabilities of micron children, for example. So that's, that's the first sort of layer of a social effect. Then the sixth one, they change their behavior. That would be something like migrant children dare to apply for college more often because they are better with their grades, right? And they, they actually think they can reach higher than they used to, be in the, to do in the past. And then level number six, group, target groups living conditions change could be something like more migrant children go to college and end up having higher income for the rest of their lives. So that's actual social change happening now through some kind of offer. And the highest level, real deep social system changing impact would be something like society understands that migrants are just as smart or valuable to society or just as equal or whatever you want to pick as everyone else. So that's when structural change happens, when actual mental change happens on a large scale in a society, that is big impact. The more concrete impact that's a bit below that, that's, you know, scientifically it's called outcome. You can typically, you know, pull these two together and say outcome slash impact, you know, but typically the green levels is what you want to see when you ask a project for impact or for impact reporting. Now, what happens all the time is you ask for impact and you get an answer on the level of activities. Yeah, you ask a project, what's the result of what you're doing? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, we're on this project. We offer classes for migrant children. That's nice, right? But they answer an impact question on the level of activity. And I put two red circles here just to make clear that there's a real difference here between asking for activities and asking for impact. One is really the lowest level and one is more, is more the highest level. Now, how can you measure impact or how can you document impact? It's a very difficult question and there are many different sort of methodologies around how you can try to capture this very sort of elusive concept or this elusive term. And I have a, a number of them um, in this area. Can you please unhide it, Melody? It's called Methods for Impact Documentation. Yeah. So there's, it's also some kind of a staircase. Um, so it starts very low. So the easiest way to document some kind of impact would be anecdotal evidence. So on the bottom left. So you tell a story, right? You say, and then this young boy came and he uh, participated in my mentoring class. And then six months later, his grades became better and now he goes to college. So that would be anecdotal evidence. It's just one story, one particular case where you can show that there is something happening to an individual. Then case studies, it's a bit more structured. It's like you actually write up the whole story and maybe you look for two or three cases so that you can see, ah, it's not just one case, it's not just one little piece of a story. It's a bit of a longer story and you actually 
think about the different factors and details that were involved, but it's still a story, right? Then photo and video documentation, that's something um, a bit more direct or a bit closer to the actual reality of what's happening. Um, the, the, these three methods uh, in green is what they call here in this model, emotional, emotionally convincing data, right? That's why I put the heart down there. So this is what people, what typically grabs people when they ask, you know, what is this project doing? Does this project have an effect? Does this project have a result? That, that's what typically grabs their guts, this kind of information. When you go a bit higher, then you see higher here means more expenditure. So time costs exp expertise, and we'll talk about that later. It also means that going a bit more to the right, which means it's more reliable, and we're gonna talk about that also later. So if you go a little bit higher, one level higher, you, can, uh, you have something like monitoring numbers of participants. So you can say, okay, this week, 50 people, 50 migrant children showed up to my mentoring class. Uh, the week after it was 100, the week after it was 200. Okay, so there's something happening here. Uh, but it doesn't tell you a lot about impact yet because it's just participation. But you could also monitor something like this month, 50 school children, migrant children asked me for advice in mathematics. So there is interest from the target group to learn more. That's an indicator that something's happening. But that's still a very simple way of quantifying what you're doing. Structured interviews with subject area experts is like you sit down with the teacher and ask, what do you, what do you observe? You know, what's happening? Do you see, see that these school children actually you know, get better over time? What do you think? Uh, what else can we change? Do you see some kind of effect? Focus groups would be you get a group of the school children together, together with the teacher, and you do a longer interview with them and ask, you know, does this make a difference for you? Participatory observation by external experts would be you have an educational expert sitting in for six months and observing what's happening in this classroom. Standardized surveys would be you have a little questionnaire that you give out to all the school children, and you do that every two months or so, and you get results over time. Then again, standardized tests carried out regularly. That would be you do it over a longer time. And longitudinal study with control groups would be you give that out, you give a, a survey out to the migrant children for a year and check that every month. And then you have another group of, of migrant children that do not have a mentoring class and you give them the same survey. And you see if there's a difference between these two groups. Maybe even five years later, 10 years later, you know, do you see that the group that had this opportunity to go to mentoring class, they end up in college with a higher percentage or a higher probability than the other group that didn't have that. And as you can see, it gets more complicated. It gets, it gets more reliable. Um, it gets more cerebral, right? It gets more and more abstract. It gets more and more mathematical. It gets more and more statistical. And that's why I have the brain up there, right? So it's more brainy, it's more evidence-based, it's more academic, what you do up there. And I put two examples here that might be interesting. So the, the one below with the heart is an interesting one. Um, it's a very famous project uh, from Development Corporation. It was the idea that maybe we could replace the hand pumps that pump water out of the ground in certain African countries by a children merry-go-round where the children sit on the merry-go-round and they play. And by swinging this, this merry-go-round, they produce the kind of energy and run the pump so that the pump can actually pump up the water. And then playing children essentially help to supply the village with water. On the heart level, fantastic project, right? So people saw this picture and they were like, yeah, that's it. That's the most elegant solution that we can think of, right? So let's just, you know, children just love to play anyway, so let's do it that way, right? So on the heart level, it was completely convincing. They did that for a while and it turned out, and it turned out it's a total disaster because uh, to have enough energy to actually pump water out of the ground, the children would have to play 27 hours a day. Uh, they ended up not doing that. The merry-go-rounds broke. There was no one around who could fix the merry-go-rounds. Uh, when, the, when, the when the villagers were really desperate, the women ended up pushing the merry-go-round for hours so that they could pump water out of the ground. And a hand pump would have been a lot easier. So this is an example where on the heart level it's completely convincing, but when you look at the sort of more rigorous data, it turns out that it actually has negative social impact. So it's very exciting, but it's, it, it does more harm than good. Right? 
And then at the top, there's another example. Um, there are organizations out there that really do the cost benefit analysis and look at, you know, if you have a dollar and you can donate one dollar, where should you donate that dollar to save as many lives as possible? You know, what, what, where is the best uh, cost benefit analysis between the donation that you, that you give and the social effect or the social impact that you can have? And it turns out the most, the best thing that you can do is give it to an organization that buys mosquito nets for African countries. It's a very simple intervention. It's not exciting. It's very boring. It's very unsexy, but it saves uh, you know, thousands of lives with a very simple intervention. But again, it's not easily sellable because it's not innovative and it's not, you know, it's difficult to find really sexy stories to tell. And so what you often find here, and can you please unlock the dilemma piece? So what you find here is a bit of a dilemma, right? So you can either concentrate on projects that have very solid evidence, very solid impact data. Uh, that's fantastic because that's very reliable. And it also enables for some comparisons. For example, when you know that there are five different projects that, for example, buy mosquito nets, and you run really scientific studies, you can compare them and see which one is more cost effective and which one you should donate to rather than donating to the others. So you end up with something like comparable data when you really do that properly on the statistical level. But the data collection is very expensive. Right, you need a lot of time and expertise and money to do it, uh, or you have someone who has already done it for you. Uh, a very prominent exa example is CO2 emissions, right? We all know it makes total sense to give money to an organization that helps to, uh, to, to diminish CO2 emissions. Why do we know that? Because 50 years of climate research that have cost billions of dollars have proven that there's a connection between CO2 emissions and climate change. It was extremely expensive to make it clear that this is happening. Now we know, and now we have the sort of causal chain. But when you start with a new project or when you start with a, with a small initiative, you can't come up with that sort of level of profound sort of impact evidence. <laughs> so what you end up with is a relatively small exclusive group of projects that has that high level of data or that high level of evidence for impact. And even in that group, there are no comparable metrics across domains. Right? If you have a dollar and you have to decide whether to give it to a project that um, diminishes carbon emissions or buys mosquito nets, it's almost impossible to compare. There's not the one number that can tell you the one is more effective or less effective than the others. It's extremely difficult to find the one metric to compare them. Well, that's what you, what you would do if you pick the top end of that spectrum, right? Now, the dilemma is if you go down to the other end of the spectrum, you find the kinds of projects where, uh, that just give you evidence through pictures or stories or anecdotes. And that's very easy to do, which means this is a very big inclusive group of projects, typically the kind of project that you would have on Giveth, right? Because Giveth is more bottom up. Everyone can come up with a project. Everyone can, can just think, you know, let's do this. It's the, the kinds of data collection, impact reporting methods that are used on that level are completely unreliable, right? You get, you get pictures and anecdotes and stories, but they tell you very little about the actual social effect. And there are no comparable metrics at all, right? How would you compare two education initiatives that have no impact data? You couldn't say, look, this photo of this young migrant child, you can see that he smiles even better than the other children smile on the other picture or something like that, right? It doesn't make sense, right? You can't compare it on the emotional level. So it's extremely unreliable when it comes to impact. And so this is a typical dilemma that you have. And, um, you know, funders with a lot of money that want and can concentrate on a small number of projects, they can afford to do the thing at the top. You know, the Gates Foundation or, or big donors or impact investors that have a portfolio of two or three or four projects, they will spend a, a lot of money to actually do impact analysis of these particular projects and then decide which one to pick. So they can afford to be, or to work with this very small exclusive group of projects. Uh, at the bottom, you can't do that, right? Giveth could never do you know, impact analysis for all the projects that are on the platform. It's completely unreasonable. And so 
what typically happens is platforms, funders, donors, networks, they pick a pragmatic approach to see, you know, to, to at least pick some of the pieces here that can be indicators or proxies for impact. And can you please unlock the, the pragmatic approach piece? So here are some elements of what you typically find what's happening, right? So on the left, one thing that you can do is ask projects for at least part of a theory of change and not just activity. You know, it's one thing to ask them, what are you doing? And then you get some kind of answer on the activity level. Yeah, yeah, we run, you know, migrant mentoring, tutoring classes. It, instead of that, you can ask a, questions like, like a question like, which problem are you trying to solve? To force them a little bit to think, okay, why am I here? You know, what am I actually trying to do? And what is better in the world if what I do is successful? that forces them a little bit to think in terms of a theory of change and not just, oh, this is sort of fun, we do this. I have never looked into the complexity of the actual social problem, I'm just doing this, you know, period, right? And if you want to go a little bit beyond that sort of superficiality, you can ask a question like this, which is not very complicated to answer, but in the answer you can typically already see, is there some thinking or some, some knowledge, competency, experience behind it, or is it a very spontaneous project? Then another thing that you can do is ask projects for outcome or impact evidence, not just active for activities. You, know, you can ask a very simple question like, what evidence do you have that your solution to the problem actually helps? And then you will get some kind of answer. And it might be an answer on the anecdotal level that they tell you a story about a boy or a girl that went through their program and now is in a very much better place. And that is evidence in a certain sense, or they might say, yeah, yeah, we've done a study two years ago. We know that the approach that we're doing here actually works. Here's a piece of evidence for it. And so the, the level at which the answer will be convincing is very different depending on what kind of answer you get. And again, if the project already has some sort of data, they will be able to provide it. And the, the, answer, the question is really relatively easy to ask. Another thing that you typically find in the field is you reward projects that have a strong theory of change, right? You reward them if they automatically, or if you, if you ask them to do it, can come up with a relatively convincing chain of, this is the problem we're trying to solve. This is the group of people that we want to concentrate working with, on working with for the following reasons. We do the following things with them. We think they're going to lead to the following output because of the following evidence or the following feeling or experience or whatever we have, which then in turn we know or think or have experience with leads to the following outcome or impact. And just the fact that a project is able to express this as one sort of story already gives you an indication that they are really much more familiar with the difficulties or the complexities of the social problem they're trying to solve. And you could honor that, right? You could reward that, you could reward that with a label, like this is a project of the month or is a, it's, a, it's a, an expert pick or whatever you want. But you could pick you know, a small, a short white list of organizations where you say, oh, okay, this is a really convincing story. Another thing, a, a fourth example of what you find in the field often is reward project with strong evidence for impact. Because sometimes you have projects that have actually done that homework or that have, they're lucky enough that someone else has done it for them. And you can attract these to the platform. You know, you attract projects that have already obvious impact. I mean, look at uh, Extinction Rebellion or, or Fridays for Future. They might not have a scientific study, but they have clearly changed legislation in the political landscape in many countries, which is obviously social change. So these are projects where you have a very solid impact case. And you could try to get them on board with already that sort of foundation of evidence or you partner with projects that filter according to that criterion. For example, Effective Altruism is a network that includes or recommends only projects that have very solid impact data. And so you could look through the list of organizations that are supported by Effective Altruism, or GiveWell is a very famous platform for that. That's where the, the mosquito net example comes from, for example, from GiveWell, uh, that you look exclusively through that list and try to attract them for the platform. Uh, and so you, you have already sort of the, the all-stars uh, collection or team already on the, on the platform itself. Maybe so much for now to you know, give a little bit of an introduction into some concepts and see you know, where is the pragmatic middle ground that we might be able to use over time that giveth. 
uh, and how this sort of relates to the rest of the landscape. Um, are there any questions before we move on more to an interactive exercise? Okay, Melody. Okay, so um, so we're going to move on to an exercise of brainstorming, and we're going to look at the Givers journey. And the journey is we start with the Givers journey from outreach and communications, and then we land it somewhere around project verification. So projects come to the Givers platform and verifying. Also, you can think of the journey from the donor's perspective, relatively in the same stage. And then we're arriving at, you know, after verification, project ranking, you know, we have some discussion about that already. Uh, we then have donor incentives uh, as well as project updates. So after projects come on board, they have running their fundraising on the platform incentives and updates that we will require from donors or projects or any other stage that we have not depicted here. Uh, so what we want you to do is to answer the following questions uh, according to stages. Um, so I think it actually gonna take a while for people to think, and this is an individual activity. So I'm just gonna read the question here for each stage, in what way do we consider impact here? So focus your thinking on what we have just talked about, all these impact, the staircases, um, you know, like does impact matter in this stage, right? This, this is where like you want to put a sticky note in. And then the second question is in what way do we consider activity here? So we want to think about impact, we want to think about activity at each of these stages. Um, yeah, so let's ignore the next steps because we're not going to come back to that later. And um, should we do all stages? Uh, Reiner, what's your recommendation? Because there are some links that we put here for people to read. Do we want to do stage by stage discussion or do we want to do a whole brainstorming? I suggest we give sort of 10 minutes, maybe even in groups of two or so, so that you can think through the different stages. Um, mm -hmm. And the things that were linked here, you don't necessarily re need to read them all. You know, it's just uh, with project ranking, there was a forum post by me on project ranking that dives a little bit into this topic. There's a, a one around project verification. And there is, especially around project updates, there is a very specific set of questions already from Ashley that we're going to discuss later on around, you know, how do we factor in impact or activity in regular project updates? So you don't need to read through it, but, you know, think through, are we actually interested in impact in this particular stage? And if yes, what kind of impact or, or how would we want to ask for that? Or are we actually just interested in activity here? Mm -hmm. Just to get a feel what we're actually trying to do here. Okay. And then so, let's do 10 yeah. minutes. Should, should, I, should we do it individually or should I uh, start breakout rooms? Up to I you. I think, I feel like we probably give people sometimes to think individually okay. for five minutes, uh, form some thinking, put some sticky on the board, and then we put people in the, in the room for five to six minutes to discuss with another person. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to set the timer for five minutes. So if you have any thoughts right now, put it on the sticky, put it on the board, and then be ready to discuss with someone else. Feel free to switch off your camera if you like. It helps you thinking or, or for yourself.
So time is up. So Reiner, do you want to put us into rooms then? Reiner? Oh, there. Great, thank you. So just keep going. Don't feel interrupted in your flow. Just keep writing and now you have someone to talk about. Claire and Marco, are you having uh, technical troubles or something? Or do you want to stay here in the main room? You're always welcome. Oh, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I just went to the toilet, sorry. Don't worry. So you can go to the room with Claire, yeah, sure. verified projects so I might just um, um, I know that if I donate to these projects I'm gonna uh, this project I'm gonna get some givebacks and uh, a lot of the times I find I find other projects which are not verified but they're still cool and I still donate to them right so mm -hmm. to me it really doesn't matter uh, you know the, the verified thing only gives me an information that I'm gonna get some givebacks like that's just from my personal experience. And right. I'm not, I'm probably not talking about majority here, but a hypothesis could be like when other donors find, find out that the verified badge or a verification gives them give backs, that's the incentive, then they may be looking at the same way I do. Mm -hmm. And Claire has something to say here, yeah, she raised Claire. a hand. Before, before Claire, uh, uh, I just want to add one thing. I'm hearing you, Marco, that there is a donor journey that we're not looking at yet. We're, we're, we're now looking at the internal journey of the Giveth Project Verification, but the other layer is the donor journey. Like the, there's the front of house, there's the behind the scene. So yeah. I think it's a critical point to point out because that's, really something that we do need to need to look yeah, at. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry if I would yeah. derail this conversation. No, you're not derailing. You're you're pointing out something very important. So okay. That's what I'm saying. And Claire? Mine was just a point on what Reiner said, which I actually really liked the idea of measuring the impact up front or pro proving the impact up front and then the updates could be lighter touch over time. But then when I thought about that is over time, if we're looking at longer stretches of time, just because a project was impactful at some point in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it remains impactful over time. So how would we deal with that? It was just it was just to, that I was thinking when you said that, Reiner, that I really did like that idea. Yeah, but I does mean, that necessarily mean that that, that um, project remains impactful? Or do we put some kind of, again, it's getting back to almost ring fencing 
projects to say, right, when that particular activity is finished, or this is where I want my money to go to. I guess we have a choice here, right? I mean, one way of doing it would be to check regularly, which doesn't really scale well because we have very limited resources mm -hmm. to do that. Another approach would be to, to trust the donor and say, uh, the donor looks at the project, he or she sees that the last time they actually talked about impact was three years ago when they were what we now call verified. Then it's the donor's choice, right? Whether they think this is solid enough as, a, as information to still donate or whether they think, no, no, this is too out of date. That would trusting the market, right? Uh, or trusting the donor. And I would probably opt in that case for the second one because and everything that, else wouldn't scale really. No, and that ties in quite nicely with some of the discussion that was had on the original forum post about how we sort of move away from being so heavy handed and involved in the verification and the monitoring process. So I think that would work. And then it almost becomes, um, on the side of the donor for the donor to check in with the project and helps to build that relationship, I guess, to say, hey, wait a minute, your update didn't really satisfy me this time. Can you give me some more information? And sort of encouraging projects to post more impactful information on their profile page. Yeah, I mean, give it essentially, I mean, what you could say is give it defines two bars of entry. There's a very low one that has to do with just the terms and you know regulations and you know something that really violates that doesn't get in at all. Then there's a second bar that has to do with give back eligibility or not. And we check these two bars at the beginning and that's it, right? And then we have an activity sort of uh, expiration system that makes sure that people at least have to check in regularly to keep their status for give backs, mm -hmm. but that's it. Right? That might be a, a reasonable compromise between ensuring quality on the platform, but at the same time, not killing ourselves with regular checking cycles yeah I, I just want to jump in here once again i think we could automate these processes a little bit as well as just sending notifications to project owners to update to post a regular update if they hadn't already done that um and and just like uh, let the platform do the job for us so we have less overhead basically so everything what you said, Rainer, and then a couple of more things probably that we just already discussed in the forum. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then it's up to the, and then it's really up to the donor uh, to like to hand that over to them actually to do all the checks, right? So we did our job and then they should do their job. Uh, and like, because they're making a decision, you know, where they're gonna donate uh, the money and, also like just getting back to the donor's journey and just because some a lot of the times there will be projects that will be on give it where as a donor i will be informed that there's a project on give it and i can donate there right so it's not just always going to be exploratory i'm just going to go on this platform you're just going to scroll through all these projects it's it's not always that in that case um but yeah, oh, let's let's get to the project owner's journey for now. Can I ask one more question, Melody? Yeah. So there's an interesting green sticky note here in the column for donor incentives that says we can scale givebacks based on the ranking, which takes into account impact. That would be a new thing, right? That would mean that if we make a an explicit expert pick to say this is an especially impactful project, that would boost their ranking, which would then scale their give backs. So they don't only give, get give backs, they get more give backs than the others. I find that very interesting. You know, it wouldn't have to apply to all the projects, but we could pick a certain subgroup of especially impactful projects and they get an extra reward in terms of the give back for the donor, which is exactly the kind of incentive I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that in hand with give power as well as like a ranking system, they can kind of, you know, look at these things from different angles as well, because this is kind of what give power is aiming to do also is, you know, let give token holders lock their give to um, curate projects, essentially, which ones will give more give backs and which ones will give less gives back, give backs. And I think the ranking can be considered in there as well. Yeah. Sorry, I think uh, I don't know if it's Lauren. Uh, I think Lauren uh, and more and I will discuss, especially concerning uh, give box and give power. With I think we discussed something like this once, 
And they were talking about it actually being actually not really motivating the user, more like uh, influencing the user and influencing donors to actually donate to a project. Okay, if if it's a, if a project scales scales high and then you receive more givebacks, obviously that could actually influence the donor into actually donating to that particular project just because of the givebacks. So this effectively alienates other project that does not rank as high. Obviously, yeah, it's it's a, it's, it's a good incentive for donors to actually donate to projects like this, but I don't know, maybe it's kind of like a self-fulfilling, the AI project is, and then the more donation it gets, the more givebacks the user gets, and then it's it might create a sort of divide, like, I don't know if I'm saying this right, it's like, it leans towards high ranking projects while actually ignoring the lower rank project. So instead of having a general then donor experience where everybody can actually, you know, donate to a project where you actually need to or want to donate to, but then now you're being influenced by high ranking projects to donate to. I don't know if I'm passing that message across well. Yeah. I think I understand what you're saying. And I think that kind of that bridge could be, or the gap could be bridged by this ranking system that's talked about in the forum post. You know, the ranking system would be more of the quantitative data, whereas the the give power is more the qualitative data and we can take those into consideration. And I think that if, as long as we're not, you know, putting big labels out there that are saying how much more givebacks one project is going to give than other projects. You know, we don't really need to be exclusive with the numbers and percentages and turn it into a game that way. It would just be more of like a natural intuitive way of laying out the projects that would attract donors, you know? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm reminded uh, of, do you know Rotten Tomatoes? You know, this, this online website for movies they have two scores right they have the critic score and the audience score it's a bit like that right you have the donors that they're not experts in impact but they can express their popularity that's the give power and then you have another one that comes more from the expert side from the film critics side or from the impact expert side and maybe these two balance each other out in a nice way so that it allows for a more sort of holistic decision making for the next donor yeah well, um, I think the uh, just from a perspective of donor giving to an like an organization, it it's really like the affinity that the donor feels for the organization, and it, there's a balance to be had as a third party, like a platform. How much do we want to influence these two? I feel like there is a balance mm -hmm. to have there, not like not to be platform centric, but to be more user-centric, which is who are using these platforms, how do we facilitate them, the activities and donors seeing the activities and developing more affinity and then reward them by giving, like donating really. So yeah, I think there's a balance, but that's um, my perspective there. Anybody well, else? Yeah. And then, and then taking into consideration, sorry into consideration that the give power is only applied to verified projects and the ranking system, I believe would be applied to all projects. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was gonna be my question because I, I think what he was trying to get at is, is then maybe the, the bottom projects would lose out on publicity uh, if we did a ranking system that wasn't all projects. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that it is all projects because then there will be some donors that want to donate to the ones that are in, say, last place, if we're going to use that, uh, to try to bring their scores up. So as long as I think all of the projects have the ranking system, there are people out there that would go towards the bottom of the list then. Yeah, there might be projects who have stellar impact data, but have chosen not to be eligible. They should still be visible, right? And should be approachable. That's true. Yeah. We could obviously talk about this for the rest of the day, but I think we should move on to the next activity and uh, maybe we'll come back to this uh, later on for next steps. But uh, Reiner, shall we do the next activity? Yes. Uh, I mean, my first question is who urgently needs a break? Oh, yeah. There's Just a break. Raise your hand if you do, <laughs> because we've run over time a little bit. We could pull through, but if people raise their hand and would like to have a break, we can totally have a break. 
the coffee is getting me, so I know I'd, I'd use two or three minutes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's uh, do a two minute, three minute yeah, break, great. and then come back, and then let's do the last half hour. Thank you. Okay, if you're back, please switch on your video so that you, you can, I can see that you are uh, back here. Thanks, Jake, hope you got your coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Katavi. Hey, everyone. Hey. So, it's Ashley, different. Marco, are you back? Is it just loud like this? Oh, Katavi, you're in a really loud cafe. It's a bit difficult to hear, hear you, sorry. Okay, maybe I can start explaining what's next. Um, so we have around half an hour, so I suggest we take maybe 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for a, a bit of a playful exercise. So to the right of the journey, we have prepared um, so 10 examples from the top 30 projects on the platform. It's the ones that you see here with the blue sticky notes. The blue ones are not uh, movable, but the ones below are movable and there are multiple versions of each of these projects. I know that you, you, you will not know each one of these projects, but you will know one of them or two or three of them. And we would love to do a little bit of a check with you, you know, um, if you had to decide where to put these projects, oh, I think it's not locked. Can you lock it, Melody? Thank you. Um, after what you've heard about impact and activity and so on and so on, we defined four different levels where you could position these projects. Highest level green is great social outcome or impact, backed up by evidence. Second one, yellow most probably positive social Im outcome impact but no strong evidence at least we don't know or we don't have the information and then social outcome impact not really clear that's sort of orange and then we have red clearly no social outcome or impact only private return maybe not even a proper public good project or even violating give us terms so we'd be curious where you would position these projects um, and i'd love to give you 
sort of five minutes to position them. If you know them well, it will be a matter of seconds for you to do that. If you don't know them well, just leave them, or you can also click on them and read a little bit, but we don't have the time to do a sort of a full review of them. But let's see where you would position these projects. I'll give you, yeah, let's say four minutes. I'll switch off my video and my voice so that you have a bit of time to position them. Okay, this goes a lot faster than I thought. <laughs> cool. Okay, it gets uh, busy there and very crowded. Um, so let's let's pick some some of them out to see uh, where our intuitions differ or why they differ. For example, there are people who think that the giveth house terrace has great social outcome impact and evidence for impact, and others see it almost in the red zone. So maybe the two people that position that sticky note it would be great to hear what your perspective is. I have an opinion. Oh, <laughs> Griff is going to unmute, but I also have an opinion. I feel like the, the Giveth House Terrace, I don't even know it was a project actually, but I do know that the Giveth House Terrace is looking great and we're about to have like all these Giveth people in the house in Bar Barcelona and like Jesse has been coordinating, like having people stay and it's like we have like the community, our community gathering there and I think that like I don't know, it seems like I see the social impact, like both for our community and then also for like a community of like devs and other hackers, but I'm not sure I really see it on the project. I just see it like in the background um, because I'm hanging out with Griff. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I feel like there's a lot of uh, opportunity that happens because of the networking there uh, that wouldn't happen otherwise. And just uh, it kind of builds a lot more cross project um, you know, co-creation in in uh, in the Web three impact space. While it may not be like the classic social impact of like, oh look, homeless people are being helped because of this. It's like uh, it's very niche for just Web Web three impact projects, and and it's very noticeable because like, you know, DAP Node, Bogdoni, Giveth, Common Stack, and many other projects in the space can just save money by going there and having a, a team meeting for free uh, and team gathering for free rather than paying for an Airbnb. So I, I put it down uh, in the green red zone because I think the Give It's House Terrace, the project itself is not what you just described. You described the Give It's House, which is the hacker's house, a space for, for people to gather and build ecosystem together. But the give is house terrace is specific for the terrace, um, building a terrace so that people can get together in Barcelona, like at East Barcelona and have outside space. Uh, I feel that to me is not sustainable enough as an impact is a project that requires a material. And I think it's great benefit for the give community, but to me is not social impact enough. But the give is house, which is another project, is what you just described, which I would agree would be on the top level. That's why I put the give with house terrace under uh, down there in red zone. Sorry. Nicola, is it directly to that case? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's hard to hear you, Nicola. Can you speak up, please, or change your mic? I don't know. Is it better? Now it's better, yeah. Okay, I think this is just a good example of 
maybe the project maintenance. And I'm, yeah, I'll be honest that, you know, from the project description and the give it there, it does ask for supporting, you know, the build, building the house. Uh, and I do definitely see the um, invisible value in, you know, if this is a, if this is a space where people can gather from all over the web three and like hatch things together or learn, you know, it does support social aspect in terms of like educating more people and making more people welcomed in a in a web three space, right? This is how I how I would imagine that you know, give it houses can generally generally wor work. So maybe it would be just a good um, you know to have more ask for more clarity around or just adjust the adjust the description so it is more talking about the general impact that house like this can have um yeah yeah okay i mean that's what we've been talking a, a little bit in the first part of the session today right we don't need to necessarily discuss the details of this particular case but as soon as you ask a question like what problem are you trying to solve you get the kind of explanation that griff for example just gave for the overall context of this terrace that suddenly it's like okay this is the connection to an actual social cause and then it's much more easy to say, ah, okay, this is what the social impact is. And can I have an additional comment, like generally for like all the projects, social impact, I can, I guess this topic is uh, interested for each project. It's not only about verified. So maybe that can, maybe there can be a like a um, form that comes out once a year. Hey, do you want to share your impact of your project? But then the activity and updates and aliveness of a, a, it's, the project could be more tied to the verification process. I just felt like I really want to give that comment because I've been thinking hard about uh, it since the meeting started. So I just wanted to share it. Um, and thank you for clarifying. Yeah, I think it's absolutely a good idea. Um, and again, you know, let's let's find a way so that we get more meaningful information than the project descriptions without asking them to do a lot more work. And I think there's a way to do that, that help us to intuitively position projects in this green to red spectrum a lot, a lot more easily. Um, let's do one more, one more example. Um, can I, can yes. I just, I just want to say that this Giveth House Terrace is a perfect example of why it's so difficult to have a clear picture of the impact that these projects are creating. Because, you know, like Lauren says, she's there, she can see the impact that it's having. And, um, and also I probably have an advantage because I know every one of these projects on this list and what they're up to. Um, but I think that this is, a, it really goes to show how difficult it is for us as a team to determine um, whether the impact that a project is reaching is approvable or not, and whether it's happening or not without actually going to the site where these projects are located and seeing what it is that they're doing. Like it's very, it's very difficult to really have this like clear picture. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is a great okay? example of description of the project, which talks about materials, like activities, a lot of the activities that they're gonna do, which is actually typical of a lot of these projects. They don't talk about impact, they talk about activity. So it's hard for the donor to, to see the impact. Um, really actually tie back into the fundraising 101 that we wanted to, to, to create and help projects to actually talk about impact a little bit more. Um, and yeah. also why I think it's important to tie in the story of the project a little bit more yeah. with the updates and this type of thing and keeping donors up to date, like this is what's happening. And in that way, like we as donors or we as team can see the actions that are being taken place, the evidence of these milestones being reached, and then can have a better idea of the impact that maybe they're, you know, it's, it's really kind of the window into seeing the impact without having an impact report. And unfortunately, it's, it's also not perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's ex exactly what you're saying, right? When you know these projects personally, it makes total sense to you. But I think, you know, we have to think, you know, put ourselves in the shoes of an external donor that comes to the website for the first time. The first project he or she sees is, uh, okay, we built up a, a terrace in Barcelona, you know? Is that really the most attractive project that you have? You know, it's, it's that kind of impression that you can sort of counteract by 
maybe phrasing things differently or you know structuring the, the project descriptions a little bit differently. And I think there are ways of doing that. Okay, um, I think it's more important that we have enough time to talk about next steps instead of going through two or three more examples. Um, so the, the, the idea behind this exercise was that uh, let us find a way to um, sort of factor in enough impact in, for example, the project descriptions and the way we reach out to, to the projects so that we have a uh, clearer intuition where the, the projects belong because the, this sort of color exercise is essentially the kind of um, exercise that you have to do in each kind of verification. This is the typical challenge, right? And so I'd love to go back to the, to the part of the board where we have the journey and talk about the next steps below and who is responsible, you know, who takes on the next step after the session to, for example, refine the project ranking piece, refine the project updates piece and so on and so on, just that we have it clear who's, who's gonna do next steps there. I mean, the project update piece, Ashley, that you're on that, right? Um, who, who would you need as support or is there anything or anyone that you would love to you know, see? Oh, or... I mean, I'd love to gather feedback around that document that you guys linked. And so my next steps as far as project updates will be to take the things I've learned from this session, um, incorporate them and create a forum post that's then publicly available for the community to provide feedback on um, and get some of those unanswered questions, get some clarity on some of the unanswered questions that are in bold in that document mm -hmm. and, and then um, move forward with the advice process from there and then begin with implementation. Cool. And I would do something similar with project ranking. Um, so there were a couple of um, comments under the forum post and also a couple of interesting points here. Please read through the forum post if you haven't done this yet and, and add your comments there. And I will check in with some of you to sort of refine what I've written there and see how we can create even more sort of impact components in it and then move on to a forum post where we can actually make a decision about implementing it. What about project verification? We had some really interesting ideas around, you know, from renaming it to maybe Strengthening the impact component here. Uh, Ashley, do you see that uh, with you or with someone else? What do you think? Yeah, it would probably be on the verification team between Nicola and I. And this is something that I think um, with the new form being put into the application and people being able to apply within, I've realized today that there that we could maybe structure our questions a little bit differently as far as like what kind of impact you're, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and restructure our questions in these ways that allow them to answer it um, in a more clear manner. Um, so I think that we could look at maybe, you know, restructuring the application questions or rewording them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would like to explore more the topic of, you know, changing the ter the verified term. And I think as we go through this whole process that we are now, that that, that will become a little bit more clear as to the best path um, to do that. And if it's something that we should consider. Yeah. Yeah, I support it. Again. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So donor incentive. Also, Sorry. Also, just just along, uh, well, just along the project verification side, uh, especially if now it's starting to be built into the application, it would be really interesting to um, show. You're breaking off Griff. Size verification. The if, especially if we make these if we make these questions impact driven, it would be really nice to show uh, our users the questions too, and not just have it be hidden. So, like it, the questions for the very form to show up on our website, the answers. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, I just wanted to mention that to Ashley. So, think about like what, in, like how you're going to structure these questions. Uh, and like what Griff just said, like if if a, if a question will be like, what is the impact that you're doing, then we could probably use this like one sentence, what is the impact of this project? And then all the information that we gather for 
uh, quote verifications, right? Um, we could then probably use to add some maybe tags or something in the back end to the project that we might later on use to filter something or to uh, create a special list of projects or, you know, it's it's probably going to be a valuable data that we could gather and attach to a project in the back end. So these questions might actually give us more insights and more data uh, that we could use and put in the front end, um, like on on a on a need basis, whatever. Like in the it's future. It's actually a really good idea, and I hadn't thought of that before. And I think that would it be possible to reflect answers to the form on it, like within the project description, like have a sec section within the project description that once you know, once that project is approved and eligible for givebacks, then th these extra sections would show up in their description. Most probably we could we could design a card uh, for a project that says like, hey, this is like a special card or something like I'm just making things up from top of my mind right now. How we, like what decisions we're we, we're going to make about that doesn't matter now. Uh, the most important thing is like we think ahead of ahead of like what's coming and like try to uh, structure those questions and even maybe ask a couple of few more questions uh, that may feel redundant at that point, but gives us a little bit more data uh, that we could then use later on for and whenever we want. Like we don't have to make a, that decision right now. But that's really cool. Okay, cool. I mean, it would also be you know very public uh, and would tell every project, look, this set of question, this is the bar that you need to clear in order to be eligible for givebacks. Yeah, I think it would understand. give us very clear examples, yeah, to use of where that bar is and also would provide, you know, the give curators the information that they need to curate projects or, you know, stake their tokens effectively. Yeah. So who should we put on this one? I mean, it will have to be verification team. So mm. Nicola and I. Actually, Nicola, would the design or lab team be involved in this too or? No. I guess I we think need to develop the idea first and then we can talk to the teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you can post that on the forum as well, like, you know, set of changes or example of new type form or whatever. Uh, we might want to test it out and see how we like how it works. Uh, and then like specifically, just wanted to add something regarding the impact. We could probably then later on um, you know, use that information as part of the communications, like the comms team could use that uh, and say like, hey, like these are the projects that deal specifically with this kind of impact. And we could then like write a blog post about it, you know, promote these projects on social media. We could, you know, th yeah, no, there's a bunch of ideas later on that we could do with that information. Yeah, and I think it will really play into the causes as well. I think that that's- so Yeah, good. yeah, cause, impact, these kind of and things. And more transparency, yeah. I have another column here that says donor incentive that goes a little bit deeper, right? Because it affects actual give back distribution. So who should be in charge of that or who would be the person to talk to suggest? Uh, I think maybe Jake, is he still in this call? Jake is here, yeah. Maybe Jake would be the person that could, we could collaborate together, but also I think that a lot of the donor incentive comes from the outcome of the ranking system and the give power, you know, like it's a lot of the donor incentive comes from how this impacts the amount of give backs that they'll get as well as their trust, you know, this trust rating or feeling of trust. So, I mean, I, I could include that in the ranking sort of work package to say uh, the ranking leads to a certain or there could be an effect of the ranking on the distribution of givebacks, right? And that is something that I could include in the overall specs of the ranking itself. So I could put my name there, makes sense, cover that because that's that's a technical piece, right? There is another piece around how to communicate that to donors and make it understandable and so on. But I think when it comes to the actual algorithms, it's it's probably more tied to the ranking itself. Okay, and then there is the column at the beginning around comms and outreach. Is there something there where you would say, now that we've discussed these impact topics, there's a, a change around, you know, how to phrase certain things. There's a to-do for comms, a recommendation for comms that comes out of this. Then we should have a name. If not, it's also fine. Okay, 
So let's leave it there for today. It's fine. Great. Okay, Any before we questions? go to yeah. Before sure. we go to checkout, I wanted to just close to talk about next steps of the of the connect group itself. So just a couple of comments. So we decided that at this point we would like to pause with strategy sessions for a while because I think we've developed quite a few interesting ideas, hypotheses, concepts, models that I, I think now need to be tested and implemented. For example, uh, now the ranking ideas, you know, that needs a bit of time for implementation. Um, and then uh, the idea to get in more flagship projects that ideally come with solid impact, like Extinction Balance and so on. So I think we should, in the Connect Group, we will focus a little bit more now on what you could probably call market research. So we're going to approach these organizations and essentially do interviews with them, right? And tell them, look, we'd love to have you on the platform you know, what would we need to do to make that attractive for you? What kind of problem would it solve for you? What would you need? What holds you back? And so at the same time, as we're reaching out to these organizations, there should also be a flow back of information around what the actual market needs and what their hesitations are maybe to come to give it. And so that's what we would like to concentrate a little bit more on so that you and especially comms have a better flow of information from the sector out there. And then, you know, beyond just giving you market research uh, to make sure that we get as many of them on the platform. Uh, not that we know a little bit more about the niches that we've identified. That was really helpful in the last strategy session. So there will be other things that the Connect Group is going to do, but I think these in particular might be interesting for you because they're very tangible. And also the fact that we will not approach you maybe now for a while with more strategy sessions. So that's just the comment that I would like to make. Melody. Yes, um, so we have seven minutes left. Let's do a checkout. Uh, well, the question for the checkout today is what is an aha moment for you? Do you want to share or do you want to, people who want to share, please speak up and uh, others you can write a sticky note if you want. I can start, I think yeah. for me, um, just a little bit ago, this moment that allowed me the insight to maybe require, I guess when Marco was talking and we were talking about maybe allowing these form responses to be shown in the project description is really opens a door to still keeping it easy to create a project. Like maybe some of this stuff doesn't have to be so in detail in the create a project flow, but could be added in a second level, you know, where that barrier is when they become verified and that, that can still affect their project description and be depicted to donors who are visiting their project page. And I think that this really allows us a lot of versatility. Great, thank you. Anybody else who have aha moments? You have realized something um, you can write as well if you want. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote just the, the impact portion that Rainer went over and how we mm -hmm. use that at, at Giveth through our journey. That was something brand new for me. And I appreciate going into detail about that section in the beginning. Great, thank you. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah, the same deal. Uh, Rainier's intro was really um, insightful and the way that that segued and opened up to the use of language, like the word verification, and how that creates implications around um, how people perceive using the platform was really fascinating. Great, thank you. Griff? Yeah, also similar, the impact steps were really interesting, especially for, for me related to give its impacts more specifically than even other projects and how we can use that framework to really show the social change and societal change that we're targeting. And maybe we can even start measuring one day when we get to the, the goal of DAOs and, and regenerative impact. Uh, yeah. Great, Claire. I'm afraid it's going to sound a bit like a scratch to record, but for me, it was the results staircase that made me reflect back on our own charity, how, um, how deep and meaningful our impact reporting is. Um, yeah, it was really insightful for me. And actually, impact is, is a very deep change, which I hadn't um, fully appreciated before, I think, even running our own charity. So thanks for that, Rainer. You're welcome. Thanks. Anybody else want to share? Rainer, you have any closing thoughts? Thank you. 
for spending two hours with us. It's a lot of time, I know. And the comms call is coming up in three minutes. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a hard evening or afternoon for you anyway. So thanks for being with us and being open with your feedback and hey. all the great ideas. Guys, you want to check out this terrace? Yes, sure. Yeah, terrace. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Oh, I love That's it. That's a great idea. Yeah. It is Praise great. Franco. Praise Franco. Yeah. Okay, I'll donate. Yeah. You got me. Yeah, yeah. I'll donate too. <laughs> Beautiful. See you next week. All right. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. See you. See you. Thank you guys. Have a great Thanks day. so much. Bye, everybody. Have a great bye, bye. day. Bye. Chat soon.